Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Geis Montague. I'm a recreation therapist at Hutchings Psychiatric Center. I've been working in the recreation therapy field for over 20 years. Five years I've been working as a wellness coordinator at the gym pool at Hutchings, and I've been working inpatient for about 12 years for children and youth services. I'm excited today to talk about cyber recreation therapy, how to teach social skills virtually. It's apparent that the internet is not going away and we're going to have to figure out as a profession how to provide treatment for individuals virtually. Goals and objectives for this session. Participants will learn how to create a positive online group session using basic facilitation skills. We all know how to do programming and all we're going to use is those skills virtually. Participants will learn three strategies on how to engage family members in a group session. We're going to be enjoying them on their family game nights and help them facilitate a fun time. Participants will be able to identify at least three benefits of teaching youth how to engage in positively online platforms. Sometimes they just don't think and they put something that they think may be funny and the long term effects of it kind of get lost in the shuffle. So we as recreation therapists will help them learn how to determine what post is going to be helping them maintain a positive image online. Participants will be able to identify at least three strategies to support clients in developing healthy social skills online. There's an etiquette. We all have to learn how to um, converse differently online. So we are going to teach them those skills as recreation therapists. Outline for this session, I will briefly discuss about myself and identify some restrictions I have experienced through the pandemic at the hospital setting. A virtual connection and a social media connection, how that has affected individual therapy sessions and how the school day and the school work has changed virtually, and even how therapy sessions have happened with social workers at Children's Crisis Respite. We, I had the privilege of witnessing it and how the connection itself is not the same as in person. In my personal experience of um, having a primary care physician telehealth and that was effective for me because I didn't have to travel and I was able to ask my questions quickly and the session was probably less than the hour wait long that I would have to see a primary care physician if I went in person but I also didn't feel that in-person connection that you do when you see someone. All right, and then I'm going to talk about the role of the RT plays in supporting individuals with their community. Um, thinking about what to do in an individual session and how to include that individual in the planning stages. Coordinating with their family members as well as their community providers and provide um, goals for individual sessions and how they change between the patient and family sessions and give some examples of activities that have been completed with kids and their family. Outline session for part two. I'm going to talk about the risk and increase of internet use and the harmful effects on our mental health. About 20 minutes will be spent on that. The role of the RT playing in teaching how to protect youth from cyberbullying. About 10 minutes will be spent on that. The role of the RT plays in teaching how social media can be addictive behavior and an escape from everyday life. About 10 minutes. And teaching the effects of social media, whether it's positive or negative, in 10 minutes. And if you look over to the left there, I think it's amazing how we have 319 new users on Twitter in one minute and how 208 thousand and three hundred and thirty three participants on zoom meetings now and then fifty two thousand and eighty three new users on mobile teams the world is changing <laughs> we've got to change with it
playing games, maintaining six feet during this pandemic was hard to figure out in the beginning. I had to rethink, redesign, and figure out ways to give them visual cues and how to play games with each other and still have fun, right? <laughs> so I used poly markers to um, give them the visual cues they knew to this is where your space is. I also used platforms like old um, sheets on the ground and that showed people where their space was and where they needed to stay in. I used a lot of videos, watched a lot of physical education teachers who are amazing at coming up with different ways to adapt oldies but goodies. And I played a game, Bocce Bouche, um, which gave everyone their own individual material to play a group game. Um, the one big ball that they would toss and they had to get closest to it, it would determine whether um, someone earned points, two points, whether or not they were the closest hoops together, whether their hoop and ball were furthest away apart, or whether their ball and hoop were inside each other, or whether their ball and hoop was um, too close to someone else's, or they were inside the main ball. That determined who received points or who won the game. Having everyone have their own individual hoop and ball um, ensured that we were keeping our own germs safe from each other and we were maintaining six feet. Another um, thing that I had to deal with is that I didn't always have the luxury of being outside. I had to work on a COVID unit where there was a hallway was the only thing I got. So I had to adapt and figure out how to play some obstacle courses. I mean, everyone had to maintain their distance. They still wanted to have fun. Well, I used obstacle courses and the next slide will show you some of those examples. Obstacle courses in the hallway, why not? For kids from 10 to six or even 12 year olds would be interested in going around the pool noodles, crawling under it, going over it, doing hula hoops, hopping in the hula hoops. That is something they would consider fun. For the adolescents, it would be totally different. They <laughs> only liked the version where it came up with spell your own name. Whoever completed their name and exercises won that round and then they compete who could be the fastest and then we keep going until we had about three or four rounds and then eventually they just got tired of it the other thing i did was the hula hut and i would have individuals try to put together a hula hut we would have timed events or we could have a, two people working on it um, in the game, it states in this um, video is how to play it as a game itself. One thing I did to adapt was have people wear um, gloves on their hands. And that way the balls didn't have to be clean and the germs were not passed back and forth. So I hope you enjoy the video and explains how to use hula huts, how to make one and how to make it part of a game. Partner blindfold drawing is an amazing way to maintain six feet. It's also a fun game. One partner was blindfolded while the other one was telling the partner where to move their pencil to create a drawing of a turtle, of a rabbit, or a house. And it always determined whether or not their partner was really good at explaining things if the drawing looked like what it's supposed to. Sometimes the turtle just looked like a rock. A game that was created for a bunch of adolescents was the DBT stationed games that I created. Um, I wanted them to feel the anxious feeling that they do, but have the safe environment of practicing one of the DBT skills. So they had a timed event. Each one of them had to go to a different station and at each station there was a different DBT skill. Also, each station gradually got harder and harder of an activity, so it helped them practice the skills 
and see which one worked best for them. Uh, one of the stations was a finger labyrinthium. They had to trace it all the way um, on the square before they can go back to their station in one minute. I've also did box breathing. They had to do it five times before they could go back to their station. I used a little bit experimental learning games like key punch tabletop version, and they had to punch all 31 of those uh, spots before they can go back to their station. Again, as it gradually got harder, it helped them understand that these uh, techniques are successful or not so successful for them when they have an actual anxiety attack. And regular old key punch was a great way to maintain six feet. I could position each person six feet away and as a group, they would punch the 31 keys. And I still added that team building aspect that I love to do with groups of kids. And it was safe for everyone to complete and have fun. On March 16th, I found out about the pandemic and how it was going to affect me. Our program, Member Support Services, basically cooled down and I had four hours to complete all my progress notes and make sure the gym and pool was, all the safety equipment was locked up and I had no clue when I was going to go to back. And I can tell, say today, I have not gone back to the gym and pool. I was told the very next day that I was going to work on the children and youth building. And there I was told that I was supposed to provide group activities for people and I had to keep them all moving. Well, we didn't really have any guidelines. We didn't have any protective gear. We didn't know what we're going to do with this pandemic. And every single day it changed. I went from six groups of kids getting everyone involved to don't force the games, um, to doing individual sessions, and then the partner activities, and then groups of three or four. But what I noticed in the very beginning was the fear of the virus. And one of the very first activities I did with a child that was six years old, who was scared, watching all the staff clean every single, um, platform or every chair, every table, and the walls, the doorknobs, and he was scared. So what I did was create an activity of superheroes and villains. Obviously, the coronavirus was the villain, and we talked about what we knew about the coronavirus, how was it spread, what were the signs and symptoms of it, and then I put on the other side, you're going to be the superhero. What are some things that we can do to prevent us from getting the coronavirus? Maintaining six feet, wearing a mask, and cleaning our hands and doing the ABCs. And then I also use this um, video, Daniel Germ Fighting Superhero, that kind of made him feel at ease that he was not going to get the coronavirus at the mental health hospital. Hope you enjoy the show. I had to change again from children and youth inpatient program to children's crisis respite. And I had a supervisor who had the coronavirus at one point in time, and he was very vigilant in making sure that we were maintaining safe distance between the kids as well as the materials we were using. I had to develop some rules for the materials that we're using so that we can actually play some games. If I did not do this, we wouldn't be able to do anything. So to choose some markers, they had to use plastic gloves to pick their markers and 10 to 15 um, in a cup. And that was their markers. Um, if a child wanted string for a project, we would cut it and then give it to them. All board games were you. Um, put plastic wrap on it so that we could throw away the plastic wrap and then reuse the board games. Um, eliminated some of the um, keeping the boards working without getting destroyed by the cleaning. 
We currently use games that had plastic materials only, like Sorry or Guess Who, and games such as Legos. Um, we had Lego challenges that worked because they were plastic and we could use the disinfectant on it and didn't destroy it. I spent about probably $50 on contact paper to laminate all the cards and sleeves and board games. And then I got smarter and used the packaging tape that was at our hospital. And one roll of packaging tape does one card game of skip up. And pretty much one roll of tape does any game, the board and the cards that are included. Without coming up with this plan, we wouldn't have been able to use any games at our facility. Get ready for part two. During the pandemic, one of the problems that we faced was adult clients who were isolated in their home. They didn't have frequent visitors and they felt like they couldn't talk to their friends. Well, we introduced them some free apps that they could download and be connected with their friends. I don't know if you remember, in 1993, the very first video game that allowed people to um, play a video game and interact with each other was Doom. And it changed the way you play video games and it allowed you to change the game itself. <laughs> Instead of attacking the computer, you were attacking each other. And it added a different element to the game. Well, these applications here are not as violent, and they're a little bit more fun, I think, personally. Um, Cahoots is an uh, application that allows people to create their own um, quizzes or trivia questions, and then you can invite your friends to play with you, and then it shows up on your screen what everyone's answer is, and who was the one who had the most correct at the end of the game. Uno Free Game application is playing the classic game of uno and it allows you to play with each other and talk while you're playing um it also gives you a different version of uno like uh two versus two so you can actually partner up with a person against two other players and that gives you a little bit of more strategy where you can set up your partner so you guys can win the game Ticket to Ride is one of my favorite board games and it is you get three different destinations that you have to complete and then you have to find as many cards in the color to create that destination. So for example, if you have to go to New York to Dallas and there are six blue trains, you have to get tracks, um, you have to get six blue cards before you can lay down your train. And the person that completes all their destinations wins the game with the most points. For example, some of your destinations may be 20 points and some destinations may only be six. So you may get more points at the end. And the edge is to get the most points around the board. And they have many different versions of this. And this application can allow you to play with friends or you can play against yourself, against the computer, or you can play with people around the world. It's pretty cool. Um, Words with Friends in 2009, that was the first time it was downloaded. It was a different way of playing Scrabble. And probably most of you have played it before, but it's an easy game for people to start off with um, using a traditional Scrabble game and sharing, taking turns on a board. So you can't always have to do it right that minute. The board like continues to play. So you could be playing a game with somebody for three days. So it's one way of feeling connected more than just that hour or 45 minutes you play a game and then regular scrabble is an application that allows friends to join you and it's just the um, same version of words with friends but it is just for that one hour
And then Mario Kart, I don't know if you guys all remember them, but it's a racing game and it's a traditional game that allows people to um, invite each other to play against one another um, racing or any other um, traditional Nintendo games. You have to play the game first by yourself for a few games and then it'll allow you to invite friends and then you have to use their Nintendo ID in order for them to play. But in general, this is a really cool way to get your clients to connect with each other in the comfort of their own home. Teaching online social etiquette. Is it a role that recreation therapists should play? I think it is. One thing that I've noticed is that when I saw children and adolescents um, participate in their classroom, they thought it was okay to talk to each other and while their teacher was teaching class. It's something that was distracting the other students and it was something that was disrespectful to their teacher, but they didn't see the harm in it. It also took away from the kids that wanted to learn when they were chatting in the background. So taking turns was something that was important. Something else that I noticed in the social etiquette of in a classroom setting, kids were embarrassed to show what's in their background. Like sometimes their home wasn't always the nicest place and they were jealous of other people who had um, a nicer um, place to live. So teachers were using backgrounds for their Zoom meetings and that allowed the kids that were not as fluent as the other children to show, be present, and not be embarrassed. Another thing that I notice is teaching online social etiquette in Zoom meetings with adults. Sometimes they would show up in inappropriate attire. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people with their PJs on and participating in Zoom meetings. There is something about being present and looking good while you're participating in a Zoom meeting. Even when you're playing uh, social games with your peers, you don't want to um, be too rude to your fellow members of the group and you don't want to talk smack to each other. If you are rude to them, they most likely would not want to play with you the next time. So demonstrating good sportsmanship while you're playing a game is just as important. And it's something as recreation therapists we need to think about to teach our clients. Another thing about social etiquette should be being respectful and figuring out how to conduct yourself on a Zoom meeting. It's like you're talking to a screen. You're not talking to someone one-on-one. -on -one. How do you pick up those social cues that you normally would see on an in-person thing? Are you seeing the exact same social cues that you would on the screen? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's hard to determine and navigating that with a person who ha lacks social skills to begin with can be very difficult. So as RTs, I think we are going to be teaching what to do while we're on the screen. Digital footprint, it's something that we need to know. And why is it important? I don't know. A digital footprint, let's define it first. A digital footprint is a digital shadow referring to one's unique set of traceable digital activities. Actions contribute to communications that manifest on the internet or digital devices. Digital footprint can be classified either passive or active. So what is an active footprint? Well, an active footprint consists of data that you leave or you make deliberate choices on the internet. For instance, posting something on your social media channel, a, a, po a picture or some words you'd like to do. That is an active footprint. When you log on to a project or management or similar sites, changes you make that are connected to your login name are also part of your active footprint. 
Here's a few examples of what an active footprint may do. Posting on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, other social media platforms. Filling out online forms such as signing up to get emails or texts from a site. Or agreeing to a, installing cookies on your device or browser. Those are active digital footprints. So what is a passive one? I don't know. Let's let's talk about it. A passive of digital footprints are those you leave behind without intending to, or in some cases without even knowing that you're leaving a footprint. For instance, a website collects information about how many times you visit it recently or adding to your digital footprint. Um, that's because you don't choose to give them this data. They collect it when you are on a device, computer address connects to your their website. And this is something they do to keep your information without you knowing and provide personal advertisement to just you because your passive input is being passed on to third parties that we are not aware of. Well, how can you protect your digital footprint? Hmm. Organizations like Family Online Safety Institute recommends tracking your digital footprint and talking, taking steps to control it. So first thing you can do is go to Google and several different um, website engines, search engines, I'm sorry, and type in your first and last name. If you recently changed your last name, put both your prior name and your current name. Try it with mis, um, common misspellings as well. Review the first two pages of the results. Are they positive? Do they show you in a positive light? Will it be respectful for future employers? or even college applications. If you don't like what you see, contact the administrator of the site and ask them to take it down. Set up Google Alerts. When your name pops up, it will show you it's being used or tells you who is seeing it or where it's attached to. Make sure that you um, use information like your phone number or address and age tend to show up so get in touch with the website if it is incorrect and as well as if they have some personal information you don't want on there talk to the website and put take it down when you are on the internet you may have um, privacy settings but don't always trust your privacy settings. It, they may change when you go to a different website. So look at, um, especially on social media, they have different privacy settings that allow you to only post to certain friends or to certain group of people. And you think your information is private, but then there's loopholes in the process. So really get familiar with what are the privacy settings on the website you're using, as well as your social media platforms. And a recent courtroom um, result in New York City said that even though the information was private, because it's on social media, the content can be viewed by anyone. So really think about what you're posting before you put it up there. Um, this one sounds like it is obvious, but sometimes for children, it's necessary to tell them to create a strong password and don't share it with others. And number four is to keep your software up to date. Uh, many viruses will be able to access your computer if it's not up to date with the latest technology. And it kind of easy for hackers to get inside your computer if you don't have antivirus platforms on your computer to help protect it, or if your data is old. 
that just leaves it wide open for hackers to get some personal information like your finances in okay number five i mean i'm sorry number six which is be careful about what you share like or comment to avoid sharing too much personal inf information online and if there's something distasteful or you dislike um, online contact the website administrators request to remove it and take it down now personally if i uh, attempted to do that and it is a process to take things down it's like you cannot just say please take it down you have to be very persistent because it's not always a high priority for the social media sites to take these information down one thing that i've um observing kids at school that teachers are teaching them what to post and how to post it and some simple things that they used is before you post think is it true is it helpful is it inspiring is it nice or is it kind and that helps them just take a pause before they post something one of the children at Children's Crisis Respite was admitted to um, a respite stay because her mom was so livid at her after she posted something about her shaking her booty on one of the social media sites. And she wasn't aware why it was so such a big problem. Her brother made basically made her feel embarrassed and told her i didn't want to see you shaking your booty and i don't want some old man looking at it and you cannot delete that that's out there it is there for future generations to see so even your grandchildren will be seeing it and i think the children these days are just not understanding the magnitude of how these posts are staying on the internet it's hard to get them off there is always a trace somewhere. Even when you delete them, you think that it's gone, but it isn't. And sometimes when you have a negative um, profile, it affects the way children are seen at school and how they're perceived. And it's important for us to help them learn how to create positive images on the websites and on these social media platforms. Activities to talk about digital footprint. I like these activities. I use them in groups and it was helpful for me to talk about how to create a positive image on the digital footprint. It's very similar to an old leisure education um, activity where you use the a flower where you put your name in the middle and then put all your positive qualities on each one of the petals. So the footprint itself is talking about your leisure interest and what you're passionate about. So you want your digital footprint to show you in a positive matter. So you're talking about whether or not you are an artist, whether you're a musician, whether you are an active um, advocate for the planet Earth, whether you recycle. Those are things you want on your social media digital footprint. And it's helpful for them to think about these things before they go on the website or maybe rethink what they've already posted on it. So this leads a really good group discussion on what how we want to be received on the internet or social media platforms. Uh, the five P's are something that I've seen classrooms use on their sites and it's talking about their profile, making sure you don't use your first name only, not your last name. So keeping some of the information private. And then the same thing about the privacy is don't give out your pa password, your permission. Make sure you ask permission from your friends or your family mothers before you start posting their pictures or something about them. Get permission from them because once you get tagged on something, it's hard to delete your profile to it. That image that may show you in a negative light and you may feel like you have no control. Again, contact the website to see if you can delete it but it's out there <laughs> um, 
try to protect yourself by talking to other people and adults. If you see someone getting bullied on the website, tell a, a caring adult and contact the social media. And sometimes you have to even go one step further and contact the school administrator saying such and such is being bullied on this platform and you need to do something about it then always try to keep yourself in a positive outline. So the five P's are something simple, easy um, thing that you can use to teach um, digital footprints and making it positive. As recreation therapists, I think it's important for us to have group discussions and have programs talking about the negative effects of a digital footprint. How can it affect your lives? A bad digital footprint can damage friendships. If you post something of a friend and they don't like what you're posting or tag them to something, it could damage that friend. They might stop talking to you. They may um, bully you in your school district or they may say something negative to their friends about you. Like, don't trust her because she's going to do such and such. How can it break relationships? Well, um, for instance, for me, when I went on a trip to Hawaii with my brother and his family, and we were having a great time, and I posted a picture of my sister-in-law and her child, and she was livid. She was so mad that I put her child on the internet, not alone herself, without asking permission. And that but caused a rift between us for at least two days. We didn't talk to each other. So I thought it was innocent saying, hey, we're having a great time out here. And she said, uh, I don't want my kids on social media. Wasn't aware of the, her viewpoints. And that's something that you need to d discuss with family members and your friends. See where they stand on what they think should be appropriate for posting. Um, hurt job chances. For example, one of my interns had a posting on her social media site of her smoking marijuana and it caused her to lose her job because she's working with kids. She showed up the next day a little bit hungover and the supervisor had evidence on her social media site that she was partying the, the day before and she got fired. How can it bring shame to you? Well, sometimes you may think it's simple statement that may be innocent and then it gets twisted by some other one. It may be culturally inappropriate. You may not know that you're being culturally inappropriate and it brings shame to you or to your family members and they might unfriend you or something. What can lead to violence? Well, all I have to say is sometimes postings can lead to violence. And a great example of that is January 6th when a bunch of people invaded Washington, DC. So having these conversations with groups of people and talking about how the negative effects of a digital footprint can affect their lives is important. And starting these conversations in our groups can help them start conversations with their family members or with their friends. Now, the next couple of slides are going to talk about an individual session online. And one of the things you have to start out is asking questions to the client or the child and asking what the parents want. Um, when you start off a session, you want to know what their goals and objectives. What do they expect to get out of the session? Can you get an overall picture of what's going on with your child? Do you want like a basic background? What is happening and what they want to change? What are some things that you really want to address? Some issues, whether it's like taking turns or using good sportsmanship or um, being able to express themselves in a calm manner when they're upset, not using vulgar language to express themselves. And then remind them that you're a mandated reporter. So if something they may say may be confidential, but it is putting the child in danger, you have to uh, report that to Child Protective Services. And there are times there will be in sessions 
alone with RT at times and there'll be sessions with family members. So some of that information that you have in an individual session may be private and you're not gonna always tell the parents what happened during that session. And then when you talk to the child or the client, you ask them, what do you like, like to do for fun? Because as recreation therapists, that's what we first do. We play with kids, right? And you want to know what some of their talents are. So you can pull from those talents and come up with programs that are catered to that individual's. And then think about some things that they hate to doing because so you're not going to plan a program activity that they don't stand and then expect them okay come on play with me or interact with me and they really hate that activity right and then ask them what they want to work on because sometimes what the parents want and what the kid wants are totally different so try to mesh those two things together and handle conflict with families um kind of ask them how they handle with their family members what is some of the relationships they may have problems with and then you can complete an RT assessment um, with a child if you think it's appropriate or sometimes you can determine um, progress so you may do a assessment like the set assessment in the first session and um, do it at the end of the session or you can do um, some other assessments will show the progress and sometimes that's helpful when your parents go okay um so what is the progress and you could say well they scored at this level at the beginning of the sessions and now they're at this level at the end of the session so it's helpful to use those assessment tools and then some allied um, professions have some websites that you can use and more Monroe, Carroll, Children's Hospital, and Vanderbilt are free, and you can use them if you don't find a recreation assessment that is useful. It may be simple and to involve a client, you actually just invite them. Say, hey, I would like to start a session with you. Simple, but it's effective. Explaining the rules of the session and the goals, that kind of helps the child to understand why they're there and what's the purpose of the session and kind of tell them what the parents want to get out of it, what they want to get out of it, and what I as a therapist would like to get out of it. Remind them that their feedback and their participation is important to you and it, they're only going to get out as much as they're going to give into the session. So it is their session, not my session. So what we do is what you want to do during the session and it helps us be successful. Ask the client to establish some rules for the session, like not interrupting when they're talking or um, only playing with Barbies if they want to or only playing um, coloring while they're ch chatting or something that they think is important and give them some autonomy to making the session their session. And then I ask them what do they like to play. Um, don't force them to do something they hate. And that's just obvious, but sometimes it's important to reiterate. During sessions, you may see a child or a client that may need more services than you can provide. That's when you're going to use your clinical judgment to make referrals to other agencies. This helps your client, but also helps you build your rapport with these agencies and they might help make referrals to you. You may see a child have difficulty attending to task and you may refer them to a primary care physician to increase their medications. Or you may see that a child needs a assessment tool done on them and go to a child psychiatrist to help them come up with a better diagnosis and sometimes as recreation therapists we may be limited in our ability to process some feelings and a social worker would be better qualified an occupational therapist may help them learn their fine motor skills and their adls that's something that a recreation therapist doesn't do but you may see they struggle with it and it's great to refer them to you to an occupational therapist. In a physical therapist, you may see a child that has difficulty catching a ball or running 
uh, coordinated. <laughs> so you may refer that to a physical therapist. And a, a speech therapist may have, the child may have difficulty pronouncing things or misrepresenting their words or processing the information that you're speaking. They might they have an auditory processing problem and a speech therapist would help them with that. A dance therapist or an art therapist or even a music therapist may be something that you may refer to to them because you may be limited in your dance skills or your art and your music therapy and sometimes they can bring out certain talents like I know a dance therapist and she is amazing at bringing out people's inner self sometimes you are closed off with someone but she just has a way with herself that makes people feel free and to explore that movement and then you may refer to community-based providers such as theater dance or martial arts and youth athletic programs that they can continue practicing some of the skills as a recreation therapist. We are giving them and they can do it out in the community and share with their friends and peers. So making referrals is an important part of the individual sessions as the role of a recreation therapist. When you fill out your intake, you may need to find out what are they involved in in their community and request families permission to coordinate with those programs. As an RT, you may be the person that bridges the gap from home to community events or community providers and family support groups. For example, a great parks and rec program may be perfect time to try out some of the goals of the individual sessions in a group setting, like sharing leisure materials. It is a good idea for the RIT to know what resources are out there and what's available in your community and hook the client up with good programs that will enhance your individual sessions. Some things that you may um, provide them as like suicide hotlines, suicide support groups, respite care providers, outpatient providers, um, programs that they may not be aware of. And as a recreation therapist, you can refer them to new resources. So getting involved in your community, knowing the resources that are out there and connecting your client to the right provider. Get ready for part three. Oh, yeah, on again. Oh, I can't believe you act like you're a princess. Like me, you're totally not a princess. Yeah, but Sarah's not a princess. She's a commoner. Find hey, Get off that, or I'm gonna find someone else who likes me and appreciates me. No, I'm not gonna take that back. Hmm. But you can find me. Oh, Julianne, who can you go play with? Who can Sarah can go you play with? <laughs> I can play with three wishes. You're a genie? Cool. Now I would what? like to have some friends that appreciate me, like the not mean, the mean girl. I am one. Okay. Hey, do you want to do arts and crafts? Oh, this is my, uh, my daughter. Dyla. Dyla? Oh, that's a pretty name. Lots of new friends because you were nice. Yeah, is that hey, how it works? Put your stinky fit on me, little Clarabella. Stinky. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Julianne, how did it feel to be um, have those mean things said to you? Yeah. 
No, yeah. And how did it feel to find friends that you could play with? Nice. Yeah. And maybe you feel uh, accepted? Yeah. Is it hard to find friends that always like you? <laughs> or can you always find someone that likes you? Yeah. And it's nice to play with people that enjoy the company. All right, on your set. And say goodbye. Take a bath. All right. Games for families. Sessions. You're going to take um, games that you already know how to provide programs for groups and individual sessions, and then you're going to think about things that they can play virtually. They can have the game board in front of them or activities in front of them, and you're spending most of the time telling the parents and the child how to handle situations appropriately or how to mimic um, healthy coping skills. You're encouraging the parents to be a positive role model for the child to follow, and hopefully they will mimic their behavior and carry it on to when they play with their friends or when they play with their brothers and sisters, or even when they play with their parents when you're not there. <laughs> you wanna start off your sessions with simple games that people already know, so you're not spending the whole time explaining how to play the game. You're explaining the appropriate behavior you want them to show. A good game for dealing with frustration is operation. It's hard getting those little objects out of there and children learn how to deal with that. Sometimes they quit and they give up or sometimes they'll see their parents take a deep breath and then try again. Uh, when I play this activity, I usually try to give them three tries to get it out, especially if they're younger, around five or six years old. Another game that you can play for family um, sessions is uh, Yahtzee. That's a good game to teaching how to think before you act. It's a strategy game. You have three chances to roll and then you may determine whether or not you want to use your fours for four of a kind instead of three of a kind or you're thinking of ways how to use what you got and make the best out of the situation and figure out how you're going to get the most points so you win at the end of the game so that's a great game to teaching strategy and thinking before you act Scrabble is a good game to teach kids and family members how to follow the rules and the purpose of following the rules and what can they get if they're following the rules in outside the environment of the family sessions. So they're not cheating by creating words out of thin air. They're actually following the Scrabble rules. And when they do, they get high points on Scrabble and they win the game. Sorry is a great activity to teach kids and families how to deal with negative behavior. If someone does something negative to you, how do you handle it? Do you say sorry and make it a meaningful, appropriate way to deal with that? Or are you going to be the one that pouts off and runs away? Or are you the one that's going to take a deep breath and share your feelings and how you feel hurt that such and such did this to me? And are you going to be a person that handles it, goes, oh, well, better luck next time. So again, you're using the parents to be role models and helping the child figure out different ways to handle these types of problems. They may handle in everyday life, but in a game setting. A great activity I've done with uh, families is just to have fun. Sometimes it's just hard for them to talk and have fun. They may have a very long time. They haven't even laughed with each other. So some of the games I've done is popper tags where you use little pool needles and you pop each other um, in the back. <laughs> and it's not threatening. It's just um, a lot of fun activity, nerf gun roars, water gun fights, 
lots of activities you can do just to have fun. And it's important for families to have that experience. Scavenger hunts are a great way to work together as a team and complete all the tasks and you can make them uh, have pictures of them completing the task and then they have a photo album of them having a great time with each other. Cooking and working together to make a meal is or a dessert is a great way for families to follow the steps and the instructions be a little creative and share um a treat to each other and communicate with one another having art activities is a good way for families to open up sometimes they're just so hostile that they need a neutral platform for them to express themselves without words so art is a great medium to help them let those feelings out without being hurtful with their words and it's also good for um, family members that are just nonverbal. They refuse to talk to someone, well, okay, we can draw together. <laughs> and then they come up with really creative projects. Card games are a good way to um, sit around on the table, talk about what's going on in your day, and focusing on one thing. It's a great way to start up small conversation and keeping the atmosphere light and airy and sharing ideas with each other. Hope those are helpful. I bet you have lots of ideas yourself how to get families involved in conversing and mimicking behavior that is healthy. Now I'm going to talk about the internet use and how harmful effect on our mental health. Um, when you're on social media, you feel like you're connected to other people. You're in their lives, but when you see them in person, you're like, uh, yeah, I see you there, but I don't really know how to talk to you right now. <laughs> so it's not like a real relationship you're building with these people. And you may, if that is your only connection to other individuals, you may feel lonely and isolated. And if you don't have another method of interacting with your community or people outside your home, it's a real problem and it needs to be identified that you're feeling those feelings and how are you going to make those personal connections and make it less lonely and isolated. Sometimes you may feel anxiety on the social media platforms because your life is not as good as theirs and you may feel anxious that you have to get so many likes every day. If I don't have 60,000 likes here, and I know that's extreme, I am not a good person. I have to find ways to get people to follow me or ways for people to like what I'm posting. And that can create an anxiety and sleeplessness. You might worry so much about it that you can't even sleep or you're spending so much time on the social media platforms that you stay up watching it all night long and then realize, oh, where did the day go? Uh, what did I do all day? Uh, <laughs> watched TikTok. Uh, okay, why? Um, and then you may get a loss of reality like your life is not as good as someone else's or your um, online video game goals and rewards are more important than interacting with people that are in front of you. And you may totally ignore them while they're sitting right next to you. You may have dinner with your phone and forget to talk to the person that's to the left of you. Sometimes the loss of reality is you get sucked in and you forget there's other people around you and you're lost in your own little world. And that creates the addiction part. 
like you figure out that you're missing something and you want to be a part of it and you got to check every five minutes. I've asked um, adolescents on inpatient unit and they would tell me that they check their social media 50 times a day. Can you imagine 50 times a day? Like what do they do all day? Don't they have other things to do? Right. And that's the end of that. Social media is hard on kids. It's just the reality. Um, they may feel they're not good enough or that they're not as cool as the kid with the most perfect blonde hair and blue eyes. Or they may feel that they need to be more present on the internet and have more friends. Um, I only have 12 friends. Does that mean I'm not popular? Or should I have 3,020? And do I really know those people even if I have those 3,020 friends? It's kind of putting an extra stress on them that they have to be perfect and they have to create this perfect image. And if their nose is too fat, they may get picked on, like they call them fat nose or big ears or bug eyes, like I do sometimes when I was growing up, I got called bug eyes with my glasses. And I only had that in person. I didn't have it on the internet and being bullied. And it's hard for them to feel good about themselves when they're constantly um, being compared to other people. And there's so many out there now. It's not just people in your school, it's in people throughout the United States or even globally. So you're comparing yourself to a whole bunch of people and it's almost impossible to think that you're perfect or that you are good just the way you are. Um, a good potential social media does give you good self-esteem, validates yourself because people are liking some of your posts, right? And a sense of hope and achievement. It does have some positive aspects. I'm not all down on the social media, but it's important for us to teach and be aware of how the social media affects their mental health and how easy it can be damaged and how easy it can actually be boosted up too. Here's a quick video about social media and teens and self-esteem.
couldn't set it any better. According to Cyberbullying Research Center, 1.9% of students aged 12 to 17 admit they've been pretending to be someone else online. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, public schools where three quarters or more students are minorities reported it being cyberbullied. Be Internet Awesome reported that cyberbullying is the number one online safety concern for teachers. UNICEF stated that one in five students report having skipped school because of cyberbullying. National Center for Education Statistics stated, bullying in schools happens most often during sixth grade, accounting for nearly 29% of the in incidents. So it's starting young. According to the Journal of Early Adolescence, cyberbullying increased a student's perceived popularity. So when they are bullying, they think they're more popular. The National Center for Education Statistics, schools with policies that do not allow cell phones used during school hours have a higher rate of daily and weekly cyberbullying. So when the schools take action, they're actually making the situation worse. Computers and Human Behavior stated that adolescent girls with unstable families are more likely to be both victims and predators of cyberbullying. According to SDG4, there is 1.3 3% of youth across the globe experiencing bullying online. That's a lot. According to Ditch the Label magazine, 2.7% of students with physical disability report being cyberbullied. That they're just easy targets and it's just sad. According to SDG4, children with lower economic social classes experience the most cases of bullying. Girls are 1.3 times more likely to be cyberbullied than boys, according to the CDC. 5.49% of LGBTQ students have experienced cyberbullying. In 2019, nearly 18% of the students reported being a target of cyberbullying in the United States, according to the Cyberbullying Research Center. They are targeting the weak and they're making it an easy target on so the internet and social media. And it's important for us to know this is something that we need to deal with as a society and as a recreation therapist. Okay, after we know that this is a serious problem, what is cyberbullying? Well, there's a couple different versions of it. One is flaming online arguing that take place with uh, personal messages apps of oftentimes with vulgar behavior to provoke another person uh, number two is harassment sending offensive me 
messages repeatedly, including verbal abuse and unsolicited sexual content. Number three is deintegration. Distributing derogatory or false information about someone to damage their reputation. Four is cyber talking, stalking, sorry, cyber stalking. It was reporting, sending threatening messages in an attempt to intimidate someone. In some cases, this behavior is illegal and can you can press charges on that. Number five is masquerading, creating a fake account pretending to be someone else, sometimes even stealing credentials and posting embarrassing or vicious content. And number six is trolling, balting other users to fight online, baiting other users to fight online. So number six was the last type. And if you look at that slide, um, cyberbullying is ridiculous on the different social medias. Uh, personally, I think social media need to get on board and stop this affecting our children and they need to take responsibility for their actions as a social media giant. <laughs> Here's another slide just basically showing how our children are affected by social media. Um, the suicide rates in 1975, look how low they were, and then how much they increased in 1990, and how much they went down in 2005, in the year 2000, and then they're increasing in 2015. Then you look at the next slide over there. Teens who report being bullied and saying it's because of their appearance. And obviously with the statistics, we see that they just target the weak people. Race, sexuality, financial status, religion, and academic achievements. And then uh, students' threats to harm others heightened rates in the middle school and years just prior. So it mostly affects the middle-aged students. In some cases, cyberbullying is illegal. In less severe cases, blocking the predator and contacting the school administrator is the best course of action. Being proactive as a parent and keeping parental calls, controls on and set a media agreement with your child. And there's an example of how to set up a media agreement with your child. It is an effective way to establish some rules on what they do and come up with um, peace of mind for each parent when they have this piece of paper and a kid does something that they don't want on social media, they can go, oh, look at the contract. You already said that you are going to do this. Um, there are YouTube videos and there's also um, educational websites that help parents learn how to put parental controls on devices and each device is different and it is hard to figure out sometimes it's almost like Greek um, learning these different methods of parent controls um, on iPads you go under screen time and then you go under content restrictions and then you make sure it's on there and then you can determine whether or not it's for age six to seven or 12 to 13 or even just adult content and you can restrict the type of language they hear or see and you can restrict whether they download music videos or go on dating sites you can restrict certain sites that you think are inappropriate for your child so teaching that for a parent is helpful and helping them feel a little bit more safer with the internet use. 
The reality is that you cannot stop teens and adolescents and children from getting on the internet. internet. It's just everywhere. Um, a funny story is you can take the phone away and the child would um, use their D Nintendo DSS and say, goodbye everyone, um, my parents just took me took away my phone privileges, but I'll be texting you from the Nintendo DSS. And then you take the Nintendo DSS away from them and he or she will use their Wii and um, text their kid, their friends on the internet by their Wii games. Then you take the Wii away from that child and then they'll use the refrigerator talking for through their friends. So the reality is everything is connected and there's no way of preventing them from doing getting on the internet. So it's better to teach them internet safety than um, just banning them from the devices. Um, besides making a social media contract for the kids, you can talk to the schools and set up an anti-bullying campaign. Talk to schools of having a buddy system in the hallways to avoid bullying in schools. Have like an older classmate walk with them to their next class. Something that works. Um, you can have friendship um, benches, kind of create them and put them in your schools and they're just kind of benches that are placed in different areas that may be an optimal place to get bullied. Well, if you have a bench there, then someone else will sit on it. It's kind of like the friendship bench and everyone just sits on the um, bench and talk. <laughs> Sometimes having the ver visual reminder to help others is important in a school setting. A great activity to teach kids and how to take um, the internet activities um, serious is a toothpick. The toothpaste activity. You cannot block take back some of your post or what is written on there so you tell the kids to take a, a regular toothpaste tube, squirt it all out, and then tell them to use toothpicks to put it back in the tube. It's almost impossible. So it kind of teaches them that their posts are forever and it's hard to take back. Some oldies but goodies activities is a compliment flower that helps them um, feel good about themselves is a good way for parents to talk about self-esteem and where does it come from and how you are affected by others on the internet and how you can avoid it by having um, a strong self-worth. Kindness chain is something that you can do with kids at their school districts or even in their neighborhood or even within your family is kind of put a, a an activity that you can be kind in and put it on the chain and then you connect it to the next kid and then you put it on their kindness act on your chain and it's kind of looking at how big that change becomes. Um, affirmation web is talking about giving compliments to every single person. It's a big ball of yarn. You toss it to someone, you give a genuine compliment to them, and you go about two or three rounds and you see how the big ball of yarn creates a web and how everyone's connected by each other. So the your words affect each other. So what you can do is have two or three people let loose of their string and then you look at the web. How strong is it when two or three people are, are not part of the group? And it's weak, right? So then you would put, ask them to tighten up their strings again and then have only one person let go of the string. And then you would see how even one person affects the whole group, the whole community, and their actions will affect them. And trying to make it positive every day is hard, but it is the best way to keep your community strong.
activities you can do at home. You can talk about historical bullies and historical heroines. You can talk about how historical figures like the Ku Klux Klan were negative to the African-American community, burning their houses, hanging them, and just being physically assaultive towards them. And then talk about how Martin Luther King did a peaceful march. And he had a dream that one day whites and blacks would be combined. And if live in the same community in harmony. And even Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, uh, helped make that change happen. And you can talk about, to your kids about how you want to see your future and how you want to be representative in the community and what part do you want to play. Another activity you can do at home is create a kindness garden at home or at school, and it just has positive affirmations or uplifting ins inspirational sayings you can put on a rock. And if you're having a bad day, just pick up one and hopefully it makes you feel better. The last activity on this slide is Jenga. I know you probably played Jenga for social skills, anger management, depression, whatever, and colored the Jenga and asked questions. Well, this is another twist on it. It's uh, how to become a digital citizen. And you can look up all sorts of websites that um, teaches you how to become a good citizen. On the website on the internet. Get ready for part four. This is a great activity you can use to trace um, their bodies and talk about safety on the internet. Using your head as what you think before you post. Um, your shoulders as your friends, who you connected to, who you branch out to, using your heart as being kind to others, and don't share your password as your stomach, your responsibility, and then your private areas being your privacy, keep everything private, and don't be hurtful towards others. And when you see someone else being a bully, report them and even help that child to come up with um help that child find some help themselves and don't allow it to happen on your page or anyone else's defend that child and you can always tell an adult unfriend the person block them and ask the website to delete them these are just another couple slides that basically show you how to be safe on the internet. Um, I like the online safe or unsafe sorter. It just gives some basic some ideas and kind of talking points what is safe and what is unsafe on the internet. Being smart, smart is another acronym that teachers use, but one thing I like about it is don't meet up with people that you meet online thinking that they're going to be their friends or they're just as friendly. They could be a total stranger and be a different personality. So that is something that I think is important to add to online safety and also accepting files. Don't always accept something unless you think it's a resource. In digital citizenship, it, they do a great job of explaining that and if you want to read that and pause the video, go for it. We'll take a few minutes to um, watch this video. It's, I think it's interesting how it looks at how we have a license for um, driving but we also need to take classes in how to be a good digital um, citizen.
this is an excellent resource to come up with activities and ideas for us how to present being cyber wise. I like this activity. It helps parents talk about 12 cyber dilemmas and getting teens to talk. You can read each one of these. Um, one of them I like is your mom forgot to log off and when you sit down at the computer, someone you don't know starts up chatting with her. What do you do? Do you talk for your mom? Or do you just say, sorry, she left and forgot to log off? These are like ethical questions that um, the last presentation slide showed that we should talk to our kids and get them thinking about what they should do in these types of dilemmas. Um, another one I like is you went to a party and you weren't supposed to go to and now several people have posted photos of you in them. You're, you untag yourself, but the pictures are still out there. What do you do? These are great questions to ask and help your t kids figure out what to do in these types of situations. Another, these are more um, dilemmas that you can get teens to talk to you about. Um, two friends are arguing by texting, forwarding you each other's message with nasty comments attaching, hoping to get you to take a side. You feel torn, what do you do? Um, I would personally um, put that situation and say, sorry, you guys are having an argument, but I'm going to sit out on this one. A teacher sends you a friend request on Facebook. He's your favorite teacher, but it doesn't feel right. What do you do? Not friend request them. But these are subjects that you can talk to with your groups and with your clients and your parents and your family sessions and your individual sessions. <laughs> And it's just like a jump start to think about um, online citizenship. Excessive internet use has been recognized as a disorder by the World Health Organization. The DSM-5 or the International Classification of Disease does not recognize it as a disorder. Sometimes the American Psychology Association gets things wrong. Um, an example of this is when the American Psychiatric Association recently apologized on organizational behavior. In a statement released on January 18, 2021, the organization said that the APA Boards of Trustees apologized to its members, patients, and their families and the public for enabling discrimination and prejudice actions with the APA, a racist, racist practice in psychiatric treatment for Blacks, Indigenous people, and the people of color. The statement continued to note that since the APA inception, practitioners have at times subject persons of African descent and Indigenous people who suffered from mental illness to be abusive treatment, experimentation, victimization in the name of scientific evidence, along with the racialized theories they attempt to confirm their deficient status. So unfortunately in the American Psychology Association is written by white collar um, educated Americans who determine certain mental health diagnoses are based on race and um, culture values that are not the same as the person who writes the diagnosis. So they apologize for their structural and unethical um, way of treating people with different cultures. Social media is an, an addiction and there's four different types. And according to the new influencer of social media on human behavior, a fear of missing out thinking that they are going to miss the recent text or the most recent video on TikTok. Um, the next one is mistakes virtual reality for real life, comparing their online to others and finding out that you are not good enough.
And then people adopting unique personas for different social network sites. To me, that's a lot of work. Cre creating a different profile for Twitter and LinkedIn and um, TikTok, that's just could be a full-time job. And some people are doing that, is creating that as a full-time job, as an influencer. It's amazing to me how it is becoming a different world with the social media addictions. The, the last one is a harmless ho hobby. Uh, whether you use social media to connect with friends and loved ones watching videos or simply killing time, the popularity of the passive time is increased significant over the last decade. And this is especially the case with children and teenagers as well as middle-aged adults. And recently we've had added to our phones and media devices that tell you how much time you spend on each device. And sometimes there's like three hours on an iPad, two hours on um, a phone, and then probably three hours on a computer. And if you think of it, you add all that up, that's like eight hours spent on social media devices. And that's not including your TV yet. <laughs> so, it's maybe a harmless hobby, but it is uh, affecting our social skills with each other. Um, we spend a lot more time interacting with a device than we do one-on-one -on -one and sharing a pleasant conversation. Here's an interesting story. I was riding my bike on Onondaga Lake Park for eight mile bike ride. And on there, on this trail, there's options for rollerbladers, walkers, runners, and playground. And there was a lot of options for people to engage in fun activities and interact with others. Sounds like a perfect place to, for a recreation therapist to observe leisure interaction. Well, during my eight mile bike ride, I saw 47 people on their phones. Talking to someone, looking up stuff or listening to music or totally blatantly ignoring the person that's right next to them. What got me the, me the most is watching parents ignoring their kids who just want their attention and they're talking on the phone instead. I'm not perfect myself. I've done it. And I believe this is something that we need to work on as, as our profession to help clients unplug and be present in the moment. How social media can be addictive behavior and an escape from reality. Um, we use it when we are bored, when we're with others sharing videos. Did you see the latest funny video on TikTok? Have you seen um, what the last tweet was by our last president? Um, we use it as an escape of reality or even intertwining with our reality. And I find it most rewarding when I go camping and I do not have internet access and I get reconnected with nature and my family again. And I suggest you to add that to your clients and um, your families that you work with to try to unplug and not be connected. Kids believe the fake news, and even sometimes their grandparents or the teenagers. We all get sucked in. Sometimes the information we receive, we just believe it blindly because it's on the internet or it's on a certain social media platform. As therapists, we have to help them discover to look at the credible source try to find the original source where they found the information and see whether or not it is 
something to believe. For example, there was um, a Twitter tweet out stating that the coronavirus vaccine uh, stopped females from reproducing and that stopped a lot of Americans from getting the vaccine. Now it's been debunked several times, but I still have friends who think if they get the vaccine, they won't have any children. So as a group, look at different resources that are out there to teach online citizenship or how to search out different sources and figure out when a kid or a client comes into makes this blanket statement ask them questions like where did you read it who was the original source who stated it i mean be inquisitive but at the same time while you're asking these questions hopefully your clients or your kids will start thinking about where they get their information to I did a few activities in the children and youth um, inpatient about social media. And these are some of the um, ones I got from Flag House. I liked the inverted tree. It was fun to do. It kind of points out how when you spread a lie, how it goes to different um, aspects of other people. You may start with one fact and then it spreads and spreads and becomes bigger and bigger. So that was a cool activity to do. Um, the wobbly bu bucket is kind of like saying how fragile your self-esteem may be um, after you may say one thing, oh, my hair is not as perfect as hers, or my ears are too big, or my eyes are, I wish they were violet, right? You keep adding those things like, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish, and then all of a sudden you see this big, huge curve, and your self-esteem is not the same as it would be if you stayed away from social media. Um, the team meteorite shower is kind of like um, a way for um, bullies. Uh, you have two people in the middle and they're blocking all these shots that are coming to them. And those shots represent negative comments that may be hit at them about in their community or in school. And what does it feel like when six or seven people are throwing things and you're trying to defend this one bucket and that bucket represents you and how fragile we are with just when one of them gets in and that negative green dart um, affects our personality and affects how we see ourselves. And it's sometimes hard to avoid that negative comment and still have a positive self-esteem. So... We talk about how it feels to be bombarded and then also be part of it or even being a witness of it happening to someone. And that's a great talking point and a great activity to have fun and teach that type of skill. Um, being bad buckets is kind of like using the same concept of everyone has their own um, bucket to defend and every man from themselves but then they have two or three people that are g grabbing up all the trash or all the negativity and putting it in your bucket so it's kind of easy to scoop up the negative or listen and start a rumor bill about the negativity that may be happening in your son but it's also you can change it besides negativity to positivity and think about how easy it is to say something nice versus negative and how that can fill your bucket with full of positive self-worth and self-image and you feel like you're doing something good to your community and the muse the muse i'm sorry uh is an activity where you're strategizing with each other and figuring out how to navigate this um potholes per se in the your life and working together as a team. Um, during the pandemic, it was a little hard to do because you had to maintain six feet. And um, what I did was spread out the, the, I guess those red dot 
disc things further and they had to combine and made larger um, platforms they had to stand on so it um, spread them out a little bit more and I also did not make them they had to be connected and if you look at flag house they had many different versions of it that you can adapt and create for your population so if you have any um, suggestions yourself I'm more than happy to hear about them if you've used any uh, activities that teach the effects of social media positive or negative um, please email me and I'd love to use them with my population if you have any great ideas all right next slide throughout this presentation I tried to put the references that are with the pictures some of them I did miss but this is some of the additional resources that I got uh, some of the information if you need more details where I got some of the information please do not hesitate to email me and I'll find the original source and give it to you if you request it Hope you learned a lot from this presentation. I had fun doing it. And if you have any questions whatsoever on what I presented or where I got the information, please email me and I will get back to you um, as soon as I can. Good luck and enjoy your conference. Bye.